Hi guys, welcome to Real Food Recovery. We are very excited today. We have a special guest, Christy from Life Unbinge. I became familiar with her through seeing her on her posts on Instagram and felt she had a lot of similar beliefs to what we were doing here at Real Food Recovery. And so I knew she would be, well, first of all, I instantly liked her because I love her bubbly personality. And I'm like, there's a girl for me. I like that. So I knew I needed to know her and get to know her more. But most of all, we are excited to have her on and talk about some similar beliefs. So before we get to her, though, of course, I have to turn it over to Jamie and say, hi, my friend, what's happening? Hello, Paige. Uh, glad to be here always and, and glad to uh, have Christy here. Christy, I, you know, when we were prepping this episode and we met with you, I told you how I found you. I found you from my stepdaughter's uh friend, her best friend, who at the time was 15 years old, we were talking about, you know, she, she had heard about my, you know, my weight loss transformation. And she said, oh my gosh, you should, you know, you should be on Instagram and you should be on TikTok. You sh- you're like life on binge. And I said, who's that? And she said, oh, she's this awesome woman. And she's faith-based and she talks about her journey and she's got like tons of followers and she says these little shorts and you should do it. And I said, well, whether I do it or not, I still think I need to get to know this person and see, and see who she is because she's obviously done something incredible and she's inspiring Mm -hmm. others. So Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to have you here. I deeply appreciate after following you now for almost two years, I deeply appreciate the way that you weave your spiritual practices and your faith into recovery. I appreciate your focus on your family, how open and honest you are about your family and, and the way they inspire you and your very grounded approach to, to health, you're, you're, you're holistic instead of just, you know, focusing on, on just the food. And I appreciate that. Um, okay, Paige, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. So, you know, we're, as we said, we're happy to have you and we want to start out by you telling us kind of an overview of how you landed here with us today. What is your story? You, there had to be some pivotal moments in your life where you got from where your journey started to where we are literally sitting in these chairs right now, having these conversations. So if you want to tell us a little bit about your philosophy, your beliefs, and how we got to where you are, and especially about flour and sugar, because that is a big point of connection for us. And we have very similar strong beliefs in that area. Okay. Well, I am honored to be here. So first of all, thank you so much. And I love what you both do. So I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Uh, My story starts very long ago in childhood of really using food for comfort. And I grew up in a um, bit of a challenged home and we would use food for comfort. Mm -hmm. It was a safe place. And so I grew up loving food, loving the comfort, having that friend in food. That's right. And even when I moved out and I was on my own in a very safe space all the time, food was already woven through every bit of me for comfort, for joy, for fun, for boredom, for sadness, for anger, for anxiety. And I couldn't unweave it. I tried every diet, everything every counseling, exercise programs, journal. I tried everything (laughs) over the years to unweave that. Mm -hmm. And what I learned now looking back, I can't unweave it. Mm -hmm. I can't. It's a part of my fabric. Mm -hmm. I have to work with it. Mm -hmm. So about, um, well, about 20 years ago, I came across food boundaries, Mm -hmm. um, three meals a day, no sugar, no flour and measured portions. Loved the idea. And the place that I went at the time said, we don't talk about God. We're not going to use the word God. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I knew this abstinence was a key for me, but now it's no, it has to be together. I knew my relationship with God and the food had to be intertwined. So fast forward five years ago, October 3rd, 2017. So five and a half years, almost six years this year, I came across food boundaries again. I was absolutely desperate. I have a husband whom I love. We've been married 29 years this year. Wow. Um, Five kids who are amazing and a great church family, um, homeschool. Like we have so many wonderful things going on, but I was stuck in the food. I couldn't pull myself out. Uh, Any free thought was obsessing about what can I eat? How much can I eat? Where can I hide it? Mm -hmm. What wrappers are quietest? Like all these sick things. Really. When I look back, 
I was sick, not, uh, not demented, but just, I had a right. problem and I had an addiction. So I thought, okay, Lord, <laughs> I'm desperate. I'm, my weight is increasing and I have this amazing life that I love, but I'm not, I, I'm, I'm going to leave, leave it. I'm going to, you know, take my own life on the installment plan if I don't do something. And at that moment, I literally surrendered and I said, okay, God, there's, I can't do this on my own. I've tried all these years. And I just started following those food boundaries, met a few people, had a little tiny bit of support. And through that was very committed to the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a fifth boundary. So um, three meals a day, measured portions, no sugar, no flour, and time in God's word, time with my, you know, with God, mm -hmm. because without that, you can worship the boundaries, but I can, right. I, I can only white knuckle my way through so right. many meals, but yeah, but, but, but your food, your food boundaries become your idol instead of, instead of exactly, that. exactly. So at that point I started following that in nine months, I lost about almost, well, it's about, it was about a hundred pounds in a year. I don't know the exact number, but very close to that. Mm -hmm. And at that point I felt like, you know, God was saying, pick a name, share a story, write a blog, some little thing. And I thought, yeah, share your oh, testimony. I don't want to share, but I did because I felt so free mm -hmm. that I did. I just wrote one little blog and people start to resonate with it. I'm just a, a mom who struggled like anybody else. There's nothing special about me. I didn't do anything different. I just surrendered and started following the boundaries. And so I was able to just start slowly sharing it increased followers increased people wanted more things. And I started talking about, you know, coaching and here I am just so honored and so incredibly humbled that I have the opportunity to help people and share. It's really humbling and honoring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So, you know, when, when you think about life on binge, right, how did, what led you to create that specific name offering? I, I love this story. I want you to share that. Okay. Um, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to share one blog. I really felt like the Lord put on my heart, just write one blog. It was a story that I kept telling my husband over and over. And it's like, just write it. And then I felt that that was what I was to do. And so I said, all right, I'll just create an Instagram account and write that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what name would I use? Like, I don't want to use my name. It's got to be a, a ministry of name, something unique. So I have literally three pages of legal <laughs> pad notes with all these different names. And I labored over a name for two months. And my husband said to me, stop, pick a name. I said, I wouldn't know what to do. And then he said, what about unbinged? And I said, no, that's a dirty word. No, I'm not going to use the word binge. He goes, but isn't that what you're doing is living life unbinged? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. But if I share that, then people know I binged and that's just secret. And he goes, listen, it makes sense to me. Yeah. And I, I prayed about it for a couple of days. I'm like, keep that's it. it. You keep it in the dark. That's it. Right. Yeah. And so at that point, that kind of gave me courage to share mm -hmm. that I did struggle with that, that I did binge. And then over time, just being so open and honest and having this integrity around things I've done in the past that I would hide and keep in the dark. But the reality is shame flourishes in silence. That's and right. so the more I share, the better the recovery is. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. You know, exactly. I, I had to laugh when you <laughs> said to your husband, but then people will know, like <laughs> people with a weight problem, that it's not obvious that they have problems with controlling portions, you know? Right. <laughs> right. My second name I liked was the obvious sin. <laughs> Oh, because I one. said so many, sin, so many struggles and sins, you know, if people are an alcoholic or gambler or struggling. Nobody knows, but like, you know, I kind of live in an obvious sin at the time. Cause I was very, very large. Mm -hmm. I, I can relate. Um, you know, when I think about your transformation journey, um, where did that begin for you? Um, as far as you've talked about, like some of the, the you know, the, the groups and the, that you're part of and the, and the resources you used, but in your heart, right in your, in your spirit, where did that transformation begin? How did you, how did you, what was that tipping point that you finally were like, okay, I need to, I need to do this. The tipping point was, I think it was October 1st of 2017. On that day, I said 
to myself, I'm just not going to eat until I hit goal weight. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat until I hit goal. Mm -hmm. 30 minutes later, I'm in a bag of chips. I'm sorry to laugh. It's a knowing, you do know it's a knowing laugh, right? Yes, 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 yes. But in my mind, I thought, I I could just do that. Right. And that moment that I'm in a bag of chips, then I'm eating this chips and I'm calling a doctor's office that does Optifast, the liquid fast. Oh yes, I'm familiar. And I spoke with them and they said, um, they do it and I can buy it there. Come on in and get it. So I'm like, that's the answer. Okay. So I go in the doctor's office. They have it on the shelves. I scoop up, you know, a month worth. I got, I think I got cash out of my safe that we were saving for something else. I don't even remember that part, but I had cash, $800. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there at this, you know, to check out. And she says, okay, so which one is your doctor? And I said, oh, I don't have a doctor. And she says, oh, you can't buy that until you have an appointment with the doctor. I said, okay, fine. I'm here. Where is he? Let's go. And she said, our next appointment is two months away. And I said, you don't understand. And I sat, stood there looking at this poor girl crying. You don't understand. I'm desperate. I need this. I'm desperate. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm sorry. And there was a moment where I thought I'm going to throw the money and I'm going to run out this door because, and I thought, oh my gosh. So I set it down. I took my money. I got to my car and I fall so hard yeah. because I was like, no, I, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment I put my head on my steering wheel and I just prayed, God, I am, this is the most desperate I've ever felt. I will do whatever it is that will solve this problem. Mm-hmm. And that next, af- that afternoon I got home, I was still crying mm-hmm. and I came across boundaries again, the mm-hmm. same boundaries that I'd come across 20 years earlier. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. I've got it. Yeah, Lord- abstinence. Yeah. Yes. And I felt like he's, you know, he sent the rescue boat, but I had to jump in and paddle. I mean, right. it's not just, okay, good. It's all self. There's tools we have to do. Well, and nobody, and so nobody tells was- it's, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. Continue. I'm no. sorry about that. Um, nobody tells alcoholics or drug addicts just moderate yeah. that vodka, just moderate Mm-hmm. that cocaine you'll be fine just do mm-hmm. it on just have like a cocaine night one night a week where you're going to have a little cocaine have have the you know those margaritas one night a week that's your special cheat night nobody nobody if anyone would tell an alcoholic or a drug addict that they'd be like well that's insane but they need to abstain mm-hmm. well that's right we do too from our from our th- these these foods are not foods these foods are drugs they're substances yeah. that we are addicted are. to that's They're right. Moderatable. They were, and, and, and you know, that was the thing. I think I just at that point realized I have to eat to live, but I don't have to ever eat sugar and flour. You don't like, have to live to not, eat. That's not sustaining me. And mm-hmm. so that moment was so desperate. I was excited. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't worried. How am I going to do this? It was, I'm in, let's go. And I have never looked back. Now it has not been a perfect journey. I'm very clear. I have experimented and think, oh, maybe I can have this. Maybe I can have that. Haven't we all? (laughs) But I have never once looked back thinking there's another plan. There's another, this is the absolute answer and brings freedom, unimaginable freedom. Yeah. And had you grabbed that $800 worth of food and ran out the door, you would have been right back in it within two to three weeks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And worse. Yes. Well, it's Absolutely. not even Optifast. Sorry. I, I, any of those, those food, I, I did it. It's not even food. Too. It's powder. Mm-hmm. It's powders. Yeah. It's processed, highly processed. It doesn't matter. The problem right. is it doesn't address the issue. Exactly. That's right. Even every single, you can't name a program I I wasn't on, Mm -hmm. but do you think one person asked me how, how was I feeling or what stress was I dealing with or what are, what are my emotions around food? Yeah. Childhood behavior. And I'm feeling obsession. And I got a lump in my throat when you were talking, describing, I could just really envision you with sitting in the car with the head on the steering wheel, how many of us have had our head on the steering wheel just as a resting place because we couldn't hold our head up. It was so physically overwhelming and emotionally overwhelming that you are just overwrought and it just, your energy leaves and all you can do is lean forward. That's right. That steering wheel holds you up. It's so the word desperation that you use is a perfect 
Mm. adjective for what it feels like. It is the darkest. I don't know what to do. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why all these other people are walking around acting like nothing's wrong. This is an emergency. Doesn't the world see I'm in an emergency here. I I cannot find my way out of it. Yeah. You you were talking about food boundaries as well as having five kids. Mm -hmm. We we really hadn't uh, thought about talking about that. But when you my heart always goes out to mothers with young kids. How in the world do you keep boundaries when you've got a million little kid snacks around, unless you make the the home change? How, how did you do that? Well, I was convinced early on that I was not going to let my kids have this struggle that I had. Uh So I always served mostly healthy things and they never had we never had cookies. No, we had them in the house. They were, I would hide them for okay. me, but they never had like cookies all the time and sweets all the time. We did try, we would have Sunday night dessert, which all of my kids, they rotate through making a special thing by homemade and the, they share that together. So that's okay. kind of a special weekly thing they have, um, you know, birthday parties when you're out, we just said, we're not going to bring any of that in. So it wasn't a huge change for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were some parts for sure that was a change for them, but I was convinced that I was going to just make some modifications for myself and not, uh, not cook two separate meals. I wanted to eat with my family. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be this. Okay. Mom's eating her own little food. No, I'm eating what we eat, but I don't eat the bread. So I have a lettuce wrap or I started coming up with recipes to address that and mm-hmm. making modifications. And they also, one, one thing I did that I thought was clever was I didn't, you know, they have like, if they go to a birthday party or Valentine's day or something, they have different candy that they might get. I don't tell them they can't have candy. We do have some things in our home, you know, to help for them to know we've already had sugar today. I don't need any more. Um, so I am trying to teach them all of that, of course. So they don't have free reign, but I just went to the dollar store. I bought five little, you know, buckets and I got my label maker and they each have a bucket with their name on it in the pantry. Mm -hmm. So if they've gotten a gift from someone or Christmas candy or Valentine's, they put it in their bucket and it's theirs. I don't have to see it. It's not my favorite thing on the shelf and it's usually just a small amount. And so that was an easy solution to just keep it, you know, out of my eyes, eyesight. That's, right. That's huge. That's huge. One so of the you've things. Got good cooperation. Sorry, Jamie. You oh, got no, go ahead. cooperation from your family. It sounds like they're your your biggest fans. Sounds yes. Like and I think, you know, I talk to some women who say they struggle and I say, you're the one buying the groceries. Like That's reality right. is if That's you have right. teenagers are different. Okay. Cause they're yeah. going to bring some things in and out. But if you're the one buying the groceries and you're the one serving the meals, you can just make a change to obviously talk to your spouse because that can be, you know, you would need to be on the same page of some sort, but you can do that. You don't have to serve chicken nuggets and French fries to your kids. Just, this is what's for dinner. Eat what you like and you'll have breakfast in the morning, you know? So, and I'm sure, don't you think your kids' palates have changed since you've exposed them to that type of food that that is normal for them? You know, and it's not even that different. It's just, yes, their palates do change because that's reality. Our palates change when we stop, when we cut out those high dopamine foods like Doritos. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, there is that taste that if you have that and then you have a carrot, a carrot tastes like water, <laughs> which is ridiculous because if you eat well, a carrot is so incredibly sweet. That's right. Exactly. So yes, they do. Um, you know, they don't eat exactly like I do, but much better than it would be if I was still in the food and serving them just kid food. I don't, I try not to look at it as kid food. It's just good food, protein, fruit, vegetables, grain, and fat. And that's what we eat. Right. So one of the, one of the things that you mentioned that I really like that I want to page in our, in our uh, community that, that we met in, we do a lot around food cues. We talk a lot about food cues and triggers and what Christy did with the buckets in her pantry. Yeah, so She reorganized, you know, that, that part of her pantry and maybe even other parts of her pantry or refrigerator to, to minimize those cues, right? Those visual mm-hmm. food cues. Mm-hmm. So every time she opened her pantry, she wasn't looking in at, 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 you know, the processed candy. 
yes. um, or the candy period. Yeah. Uh, so I think that when we think about, you know, we talked a little bit about moderation. Um, have you, when you try, you mentioned your journey hasn't always been perfect. Mine either. What did you, at a point after 2017, did you try moderation? Did you try to, to, I can add this back in and see how it goes. I did. Um, on the, the first time I did, I was nine months, totally sober, food, mm-hmm. sober, sugar, sober, completely wow. three meals a day, solid, not one blip, not one slip. Wow. And it was Easter Sunday. We started that morning with Easter baskets, with sweets. We went to a buffet. We went to a friend's house. There was cookies, cake, all the things that Easter brings, right? right. Late that night, my husband went to bed. I put the kids to bed. I was sitting in the uh, living room just for a moment by myself. And I saw the Easter baskets. Most apocalyptic. And my willpower was done for the day. And I should have gotten bed. But I just sat there and I thought, come on. And I believe very strongly that there's a saboteur. The enemy Mm -hmm. wants us back in the food. Because I'm Mm -hmm. not useful when I'm in the food. I mean, I I still take care of my family and all that. But in terms of in this arena. Mm, That's right. So I said, I'm just gonna have one piece of chocolate right before bed. And I did. I thought, see, no problem. I just had one piece and I got very prideful. I woke up the next day, no big deal at all. I could even have another piece. And I did. By that night, I was so incredibly sick because I thought, okay, I got to eat all the things, all my favorites. I'm off today. Right. And I was terribly sick. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, no big deal. Tomorrow I'm back on track. And I was off for five days Mm -hmm. because I could not get myself together. And again, came to a very desperate place of, okay, Lord, I knew the answer. And here I was jumping in thinking I could have one piece. I cannot have one piece. I do not want one piece. I want it all. Right. That's (laughs) what I had to come to the conclusion. I don't want a donut. I want a box. Oh yeah. Box. Oh yeah. I don't want a cookie, you know, I want them all. So it, another great moment of being prideful and falling because pride comes before, before the fall great. and back to surrender. Yeah. And then of course, over the years, I haven't had one that extreme, but like trying, I'm going to have some chips or I'm going to have corn chips. I mean, they're not really flour, are they? <laughs> well, you can't eat just one. The package on Lay's potato chips even says that. Right. it's not sugar it's not flour right. but i can't it's have that, it's one. fat and salt it's fat yes. and salt combined yeah. and there is sugar in some of those processed yes I'm sure there is definitely so i very much did try and think oh maybe maybe yeah there is no maybe if i, yeah. I ever go off plan into one of those things it's because i lied to myself and just i'm not interested in keeping the boundaries today well typically then you 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 can't just do that periodically because you're all of a sudden your body's going to be craving that your brain's going to say, well, you made an exception last week. Let's go this week. What's That's wrong right. with you? That's right. So abstinence is so freeing. It's so incredible that, you know, the women I talk to, they say, it must be so hard. Like, how do you do that? I say, you don't understand. Yes. At the beginning, there's a detox. There's a little bit of a learning curve but then it's easy. Like abstinence is easy. Moderation is hard. Right. Right. Yeah. So true. It, so is that true. Your, it, when you have people ask you about moderation, do you have a one liner that you lay on them? Um, I think one of them I've said is a hundred percent is easy. 99% is hard or none is easier than one is what I usually right. say, yeah. which yeah. means the same thing, but yeah. none is so much easier. One just lights you up. It lights you up totally. and you want more. It puts the food monkey on my back. Totally. I, That's right. I think I was That's telling right. you, uh, Jamie, or somebody about the story. I was at the gym the other day and just a bunch of guys were standing around giving each other trouble. And we, I, somebody had said, oh, I can't wake up. I haven't had my two cups of coffee this morning or something like that. And I said that, you know, you shouldn't even drink caffeine. I was giving him a hard time. And then we got onto the topic of sugar. And then somebody else said, if you had to choose one, You can only, you have to eat one of them, sugar or caffeine. What would you eat? And, you know, I thought for a second and then I said, I guess if I had a gun at my head and I had, it was a life or death thing. You have to eat one of these things. I said, I guess I would take one sip of caffeine because 
one bite of sugar lights me up like a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as one bite of sugar for me. I can have a sip of caffeine and it's not going to affect me. And I don't drink caffeine either. But if I, there was a gun at my head, I would definitely choose the lesser of the two evils. Yes. Yes. I literally have a chemical reaction to sugar that I cannot control. Right. Right. And so many people just say, just stop at one bite, you know, just have one. (laughs) But if you don't I know, I, be here. I know. And if you don't know, you don't know. And you yeah. can't explain it. I mean, I've been able to explain it to people, my husband, my kids, they understand my perspective, but they don't know what goes on in here. Like you said, right. light up like right. fireworks. That's exactly what happens. It's and if like you know, itch, you know, it's an itch inside the brain that you, that your brain says you cannot scratch exactly. this itch any other way but exactly. through sugar and it's going to drive you mad until that's you get, right i i you, you will you're going to lose your mind until you uh, get what you want i talk about going to a wedding and all i'm like is how fast can that lady get down the aisle because that's all that's between me and what's waiting for me in the reception room yeah that's the only reason i went to weddings do you think it was for her no it was for me. <laughs> And what was happening in the other room after? So. I don't think you're alone, Paige. I don't right. I think most, here's what I see. I see, I live up the street, ha, a block up the street from a, from an ice cream parlor. And it's, I live in a beach town and, and that's every, and the line is out the door down the block every night. And I, and I walk on the other side of the street by it when I walk my dogs at night. And I think, you know, here are these people and they they just flock to the place. And, you know, and they, that is for them part of the whole experience, just like right. people that go to weddings, it's part of the whole experience, the cake, the food, the, you know, that's what they, they think that they're there for that experience. They're really not, but that's right. what, that's what, you know, um, drives them. Yeah. And it's so interesting. You can watch, I live on the, the, blo- the Western block of, of this place. And you can watch the flock starting around seven o'clock at night. These people just flock in down toward this ice cream place. And it's like, like to a flame. And, but yes. And they're all smiling and jumping and laughing. And I'm like, I know exactly. They're not going to the beach. They're going to the, get their fix. And I just yeah. think it's so, it's so fascinating. And I, yeah. I was them. I, I get it. Um, it's not, it's not a judgment thing. Christy, um, you know what, if you could summarize your greatest piece of advice for those in recovery or how to protect your, their recovery, what would it be? Um, first and foremost, don't think that you can do it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, you can temporarily, you can white knuckle your way for a little while, mm-hmm. but long-term, if you truly want long-term recovery, there has to be a surrendering to God. I mean, there just has to be that spiritual side. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there also needs to be connection with other people in recovery. What's surrounding I'm not mean? saying I I've, I've never done a 12 step so I'm not exactly sure what that is but I know the I mean I know what it is. But the concept of getting to a certain amount of meetings a week there's power in that. Yeah. There is so whether it's 12 step or just finding a group of people, a small group, it doesn't even have to be a big group of people that are on the same journey yeah. and that you can say I'm struggling because I want to eat this whole thing of this. I got you. Let's just talk, talk it out, just sharing it. So having a safe space, whether it's a Facebook group, a Zoom group, whatever it is, find people in recovery on that same path, same journey. I think that's Agreed. huge, huge Agreed. to have that support. When you, you said surrender, people... oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So I just want to follow up real quick. When you said surrender, Paige and I, you know, our spiritual practices, we understand that, that word and what it means. Can you describe what that looked like or felt like for you when you surrendered this, this struggle, this addiction to God? Um, I kind of, I have an example that I use because one of our surrender sisters, we, in, in one of my, in our group, her mom had Alzheimer's and her mom was trying to make the bed basically. Mm -hmm. And so it's like her mom kept holding on to this one corner and saying, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. And the daughter who said, mom, you just have to let go. And I can just whip it right into shape and it's going to go where it needs to go. 
-hmm. And the mom said, I, I can't let go. I, I just can't let go. And the daughter said, trust me, let mm -hmm. go. And the mom let go. The daughter did a little whip and shake, laid perfectly on the bed. Mm -hmm. It's those moments that we think, whether it's the corner of a bed or our food plan, I can't let go of this. This is too big in my life. And the idea of sugar, not letting go. It's not the food. It's the relationship. It's the comfort. It's the using of it. It's our friend. Right. And if you oh, had yeah. it for so long, it was my friend and yes. I didn't want to let go. Yes. And the surrender means I don't know what this is going to look like letting go, but I'm going to trust you, God, with whatever comes because this isn't working. That right. friend and sugar is just going to slowly take my life. Yes. So it's big. It's scary to let go and that surrender piece, but letting go puts us in a space that, okay, now what are you going to fill me with? And trusting that his strength is much bigger than, you know, his strength is made perfect in my weakness exactly. and acknowledging my weakness that, okay, fine. I can't do it. I'm going to let, just let go. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful place uh, to be. Yeah. I, you know, when you're in that place of trust and letting go, then you're teachable. Yes. And until you are in that teachable moment, it just doesn't work. That's right. So, uh, Jamie sure. and I are on the same page with you as far as practicing a deep spirituality practice in each one of our lives. But do you have people that are like anti-organized religion and things like that, that they won't heed your message because it's too spiritual or too religious or things like that. I didn't know if you, you, what, how you answered to that, or if you had that experience. Probably. I mean, I don't know per se. I mean, I'm sure there are people, I have had people that said, you know, as soon as you start talking about God, I'm out. I, I'm, That's I'm, what I'm I mean. Like, That's unfollow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. You know, unfollow because I love all that you say, but I'm, I'm not going to be talking about God. And yeah. unfortunately it's because probably they had a bad experience with people who right. represented exactly. God. That's the sad That's part. Right. Um, but uh, excitingly enough, I've had several people say, I have never read the Bible. I don't know God, but I'm, I, I like you. I like your joy. I like what you point to exactly. and I want to try it. And it's exactly. been beautiful because they get to develop that personal relationship themselves. Yeah. And that surrender, but yes, mm -hmm. there is definitely some people that they hear that word and they say, I'm out. Right. So I, I've had that experience too. So oftentimes I tell people, I, it, let's say, let's not call it God. Let's just say some type of higher power. And when I talk about spirituality, I'm just talking about connecting to something that's bigger than yourself. It doesn't have to look like what I do, what Jamie does, what you do, just connecting on a deeper level inside your soul yeah. as a place to go it's the place you went when your forehead was on the steering wheel. That's what I'm talking about. You need yes. to some place to send your thoughts when you can't hold your head up straight. So whatever that looks like, then let's just sub that in for spirituality and keep moving. Cause I promise there's something here for you. So yeah. anyway, I just wanted to share about that. Yeah. yeah. You and know, for me, uh, for me, I was just going to add those the hole in the soul, right? So the hole in the soul and I, you know, God put that hole there. Yeah. God put that hole in my soul because it was, you know, sized for him only, but I was trying to fill it with food. I was trying to fill it with things or relationships or, you know, other distractions and I, and idols. And until I filled that hole with, you know, God's word and, and God's mercy and grace and all of the, the ways that, that, you know, um, the, the gospel lives through me, I did not, I could not let go of the food. Me too, completely. And in fact, when I first started this recovery process, I, I, it was God and food. I had to have those together or it wasn't going to work. I had to have God in the high place food next. And for the first nine months, I think, I mean, I had a great relationship with the Lord, but I had food. I got the boundaries down. I'm good. Right. And then I quickly realized, and the Lord showed me that that is not good <laughs> and let me have a little fall. Um, Oh, oh, I forgot exactly what it was. Oh, I know what I'm going to say. So then I was working with women and I thought, should I just kind of try and have it a little bit separate? So it's a, the word, I guess a, a word would be secular or yeah, spiritual. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I couldn't, like I tried because I thought, I just want to help everybody who loves the Lord, everybody who doesn't know God, everybody right. everywhere. 
And then I realized I couldn't speak to that because my only experience was finally allowing that surrender and getting God back in the high place. Mm -hmm. So that's the only place I could talk from. And so then I kind of dove deep, you know, head first into that. Everything I say is, you know, going to have that included Mm -hmm. because, and of course, you know, all the, all the pillars, if you will, of of God, but then recipes and, you know, all the things I felt like it needs to be a lot of things together mm-hmm. and yeah. from that starting place. Yeah. yeah. So this leads right into my next question of, do you ever feel like you have arrived, so to speak, like, okay, I've got this now I I'm at the finish line. Or do you feel like recovery is a forever one day at a time thing? I have not arrived and <laughs> nor will I believe I will ever have arrived this side of heaven. I just, it's a trick well, question. <laughs> yeah, I always will have that struggle. That's the thorn in my side. It just is. Yeah. Um, it's way better. It's great. I'm maintaining a hundred pound weight loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not even exactly where I think I'd want to be, but I'm mm-hmm. so far better than I ever dreamed sure. I would be um, physically, emotionally, mentally. Mm-hmm. So I think it's also the beautiful struggle that draws me to something bigger. It's that struggle that draws me to the Lord. And I will take that struggle for that purpose because otherwise then I'm serving myself and I'm my own, you know, I've created myself as an idol. And so true. yeah, so true. Uh, so Christy, I know that, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, I just heard the other day, a chi- the Chinese symbol for crisis is the same as opportunity. So it made me think mm-hmm. what you just said, that uh, the struggle keeps us in the opportunity. Yes. 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 That's yes. great. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Yeah, page. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. You have Christy, you've created <laughs> such a, 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 a beautiful online community, both in TikTok and Instagram. And, and you have, you know, shorts on YouTube, you've, you've got this online presence. Um, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you balance being online um, and, and in social media, which we, you know, I, I have, it's a very, for me anyway, it's, it's a, um, it feels like I'm going against all of my values to do a lot of social media. It feels very, um, it just, it's hard for me to do. And yet I know in order to help people, that is where to, you know, that that's, that's the sea we must fish in Mm -hmm. and, uh, or maybe not must, but that's the sea that a lot of people uh, can be found in. (laughs) Yes. And so how, how do you help people? How, do, and how do you rectify your social media presence with your values? Okay. That's a great question. I love that. So I did not ever intend to be filming myself and making videos or cooking <laughs> or sharing vulnerable stories. Like I do right. Never in a million years would I've said I would do that. I, yep. I wouldn't. Right. But I do. So it was a process of, I'm going to share one thing. And when I got messages from people that said, I, ne- I thought it was alone. I'm like, right. no, honey, you're not alone. There's so many of us that right, right. the same way. Yeah. And then I'd share a little bit more. And mm-hmm. then I would think, okay, I'll share this really vulnerable story. And there was a one point, you know, my kids. So it started with Instagram, mm-hmm. Facebook. Mm-hmm. Then I started with YouTube and then TikTok. And I, oh, I, I am very, so I already knew I needed to be on social media to monitor and to keep up with the things that my kids will experience. So I already had an intention to do that. Not like I, not the presence I have, not like I had planned this. I was just going to kind of learn in the background. Yeah. So at one point I said to my husband or my daughter was making something and she's like, I'm going to film myself. Hi, I'm so-and-so. And, and I said to my husband, do you think I should be doing all these videos? Mm-hmm. And he looked me in the eye and said, it's a little late to be asking that. <laughs> <laughs> and he was totally right. And I said, I know, I know, but I'm, you know, he's like, you are helping so many people. And so what I do, I try and remind myself, I don't share anything that I wouldn't be comfortable somebody sharing. I yeah. try and think I'm going to share this. What if I'm sitting somewhere and it gets played back to me? Exactly. So I don't, I don't share my kids on social media. I think I accidentally had a couple with them early on that I've since deleted. Okay. Um, and I don't share anything inappropriate. I don't, when I post something, I double check the lyrics to every song. I mean, I'm obsessive to make sure that it fits with 
in line with what yeah. I need to be saying. I agree. The good news is I can pull up any of my kids' accounts or their phones and very quickly look at messages, look at this, look at history, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm familiar with it. Right. I didn't know I'd be familiar with social media and the way I am. Right. So that was not the plan, but it's a blessing. And what I stand on and rest in, and this is what I show to my family, because it does take time, a lot of hours to do what I'm doing that I never oh, intended. Yeah. I was a stay at home mom for 20 years, helped my husband at his office mm -hmm. and loved it. And then the past three years has really ramped up to actually working a lot. Sure. Um, so I always share the messages. And when I get messages of people saying, I was so desperate, I literally was on my deathbed. I was ready to take my life and I came across you and you gave me hope. Yes. And so when one time someone called me a hope dealer and I was yeah. like, you guys, family, look, look at what God has yeah. done. Mm -hmm. That yeah. Those are the messages. I just rest yeah. in all of those. When people reach out to me and say, yeah. thank you with these private messages that are desperately vulnerable, vulnerably beautiful. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely. what I say is we sell hope. That's what yes. we yes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you offer coaching, counseling, or other resources to help process food addicts? I do. Um, initially, I thought I'm just going to help people and, and share. And my time was so sucked up that one particular year we were homeschooling and I was like, I don't have time for that. And I thought, whoa, I got to step back because yeah. that is my priority. Yeah. And so that was the point I started opening up. I thought, I'm just going to open up a small group coaching and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I had 30 people sign up for this 60 day surrender. I thought I'm going to do this, started creating a curriculum. And then now it's a self-paced course. Mm -hmm. And then people can watch the course in a small group yeah. together. And we facilitate, you know, have encouragement time. There's a sign, you know, it's, it's basically, um, uh, bite-sized videos right. and quick steps for actionable results. Mm -hmm. And we do that together in a group. And then I also have one-to-one -one coaching because it had to make sense to be able to help a lot of people and to be able to keep my family as my number one priority. Mm -hmm. But yet this ministry is so needed and so beautiful. Yeah, so totally. it's nice to be able to, to tie those together. Yeah. Totally. Great. What advice do you offer people who can't seem to break the binge restrict cycle? Um, I was reading that question earlier today and I thought, let's see. I was really thinking about that one. The big thing for that is, first of all, never give up is what I, number one, because it's really easy to give up. Yeah. It's really easy to say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So rather than looking at it as giving it up, giving up, mm -hmm. flipping that as I can't do this, I need help. We don't yeah. want help. We are, our nature is like, I can do it. I'm this independent little person. I don't want help. But that independent little person is going to binge and restrict and try and try again. That's right. So not giving up and just being willing to acknowledge the fact that maybe you can't do it on your own. And that's okay. That's, that's not right. a weakness. The strength and the courage it takes to reach out and say, I can't do this mm -hmm. is so strong and so amazing. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not a weakness. Point. Yeah. It's not weakness is sitting in our own self thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. Right. So I always it's want people to see it's strong and courageous to reach out. Agreed. Agreed. How do you, you know, one of the, one of the hallmarks of, of our, of our addiction or obsession with food, processed food, sugar, flour, um, is for me anyway, one of the hallmarks of it is a very, very, um, overactive brain, overactive thought patterns, um, overactive emotions, uh, overactive sleep or wake cycles, things like that. How, what kinds of things do you do to keep a calm brain? You know, it sounds like your boundaries that you talked about, right. Including the, the prayer time in the morning, those set the, those set the, the stage for, is there anything else you do to keep a calm brain? Um, I do because I have that crazy overthinking intrusive thought brain all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have anxious thoughts regularly. So that coupled with th those anxious thoughts and um, intrusive thoughts are what draw me to food because I just need to calm this moment. So exactly. a milkshake will really help. And it does 
we have to acknowledge that in that moment, one moment, it does calm things. Now it creates a bigger war and a whole mess of things we know, so it's not right. worth it. No. But in order to keep my brain calm, I, I regularly take five deep breaths. Mm -hmm. We're breathing anyway. Why yeah. not make them deep and intentional yep. at times? So when I find myself getting worked up around my house because it feels chaotic, there's too much noise, there's too much mess or stuff out or too many things on the calendar, all the kids asking for one things at once. I just, I, I have a mantra I say, as I stop, pray, walk away. That's what I do when I'm tempted or even in these moments, yep. I don't walk away in those moments because if someone's trying to talk to me, I need to be there. But I, I just kind of take my breaths a little bit deeper yep. and I breathe in and I breathe out. Mm -hmm. And automatically when we do that, it has been proven to calm us down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it just, even if, I mean, everything's still chaotic. Everyone still needs things in the moment, but <laughs> I'm calmer and I'm slower and I get quieter and it's methodical. And so if I stop and do that, it automatically calms my brain. Yeah. The other thing I do is I plan out my meals yeah. ahead of time. So usually mm -hmm. the night before or the morning of, mm -hmm. and then my brain is not jumping around. What's lunch? What's lunch? What's lunch? What do you have? You could exactly. have this, you could have that. I think, exactly. okay, I've already planned this turkey salad or whatever it is. Yeah. And I can just go right to that. So that Good helps a lot. Good for you. Okay, I've got one more question and then we've got four listener questions and I know we're about out of time. So I'm going to, we're going to whip through these because they're so good. I, I want to make sure you have a chance okay. have a chance to hear what you say, but where do you stand on the scale debate to weigh or not to weigh? Hmm. Not to weigh often not to weigh often. I'm, if, if it's not a trigger, then someone wants to have, first of all, not more than once a week, mm -hmm. period. There is no reason someone needs to weigh more than once a week. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think there is a reason. I like to weigh every 10 days. I have a hundred day tracker. And so I kind of do 10 days at a time. Mm -hmm. That's just a good window of time. Okay. I've had these days and then, you know, I weigh 10 times in a hundred days or I'm good with, I think once a month is even better. Yeah. That's the ideal to me is pick the first of the month, 10th of the month, pick your favorite yeah. number yeah. and weigh that time every month. That's yeah. it. Because yeah. we can so get obsessed with that number and that number, mm -hmm. we are not designed to focus on a number on a scale. Right. There is no reason we should get worked up about that. We should make good choices, stay in recovery, do the things that scale is going to maybe show what we want and maybe not, but that's exactly. not, it's not, determined. It's not the only indication. No, that's, that's right. So first for your question, Christy, how do I eat clean and not feel restricted when everyone else around me is indulging in the stuff I love? The stuff that you love, or for me, the stuff that I loved didn't love me back. That's right. It harmed me. Mm -hmm. It harmed me greatly. And it kept me bound in chains. Mm -hmm. So when other people are eating that, they're not feeling like I was, or perhaps they are, and they aren't at that place are, yet. Exactly. But I have to focus on, yes, I love that. And I want that wedding cake right now, yeah. but that's going to strap me back in the sugar shackles. And mm -hmm. I don't want that. And so mm -hmm. I have to think through it. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent answer. So next one, every week I seem to lose a couple of pounds and then the weekend rolls around and I put those same couple of pounds right back on. I just can't get ahead. What gives? I'm so frustrated. I would say don't diet. I don't <laughs> diet. I change what I eat. So I think we need to start eating today the way we want to eat the rest of our life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful answer. Can I ever go out to eat again with my family? I really enjoy it. How do we navigate it? Yes, there is. Almost every single restaurant has a compliant option. I, I actually created a restaurant guide based around that because people were saying that I can't go out. I can't go. Out. And I, I'm going to give you 50 restaurants, what you can order exactly. that's compliant, even the measurements, because you can, you can go out. Now there can be, it might be hard sometimes because you're thinking, I want this old thing I used to have, but guess right. what? this new thing is great too. Stop looking at the old thing, look at the new and enjoy it and be grateful yep. that you have that meal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Excellent answer. Okay. Last one. Well, we've already, she's already sort of answered this last one, right? Yeah. I, I'm going to, 
I'm, I'm actually, I have a reason for asking it okay. anyway, because there's a, a portion of it that I think is important. Okay. Uh, do you make your children eat like you do? I have always had such a fight on my hands when I force healthy dinners, any advice. So we know you heard your story and your kids sound great, but not everybody's like that. So mm -hmm. have you, do you have an answer for people in homes where kids maybe aren't as compliant? Yeah. I'm not saying my kids are compliant all the time. I don't want anyone to think <laughs> these little compliant children because they are not. But I think the word force, yeah. I think we have to flip that. Mm -hmm. Because if my kids are going to say to me, I can't believe you're forcing me to eat these green beans. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I'm not forcing anything. I This is what I say. Um, I provide a beautiful, healthy meal that God created for us that right. you're welcome to eat. Right. And if we are feeling like, oh, you have to eat this and we're forcing, but I'm giving, I'm providing this. Like I say, right. dad works hard for income so I can go to the store and I can buy this. And then we all work together to serve it. Eat it. It's beautiful. If you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. They eat it every time. Yeah. And if there is complaining, I have asked them to step away from the table. This beautiful. was when they were little. If you don't just you may remove yourself from the table if you're going to complain that this is what is in front of you. And so it may true. have been healthy. It may have been not. They just didn't want it. And so I taught them early on that we're not going to be complaining. What a blessing. We get to sit at a table together and eat food. Good point. Good point. Good There's point. kids in Africa starving. I mean, did you try not to say that, but it comes out. It comes yeah. out. <laughs> so Chris, a good point though, as far as gratitude for what we have. Yeah. Yes. What we'll do is, um, in our show notes, we'll go ahead. If you can, if you can just uh, make sure that we have your latest, all of your handles, so to speak, um, for your social media sites and any uh, other information that you want to people to know about for you. Yeah. We'll go ahead and and share the podcast here soon, and we'll we'll let you know when the date is. Awesome. Um, but thank you so much for being so much. Of this with us. This has been a great great chat thank you yeah it just thank feels you. like girlfriends sitting around talking oh. so that's what i enjoy so much we've made new friends i do too yes yeah. definitely i appreciate it i really appreciate the time yeah. my pleasure my pleasure thanks guys for tuning in to real food recovery and we will see you next time feel free to leave comments and suggestions we love to hear what you have to say thanks guys bye-bye see you soon guys